Hello, welcome back. This is part two of Narcissist, Sociopath, and Psychopath. Today we're talking about sociopaths. What sets them apart from narcissists and what sets them apart from psychopathology? Well, stick around to find out. Hello, my name is Jesse. Welcome to the channel, Open Source Owners, where we talk about what if humans had an owner's manual. So what sets the sociopath apart from the narcissist? That's mostly what we're going to talk about. Let's frame things slightly here. Narcissist is on the less extreme or the least extreme end of narcissism and psychopathology. At the most extreme on the other end is psychopathology. That's where you typically get your serial killers, people who plot and plan murders of others or other horrible atrocities. And then sociopath is sort of squarely in the middle between the two. And that's what we're talking about today. Both sociopaths and and psychopaths would be characterized by the DSM as antisocial personality disorder. And I write here that sociopaths are cruel by convenience, not as much by design. Now, a narcissist can be cruel, a sociopath can be cruel, and a psychopath can all be cruel, but the general sort of framework out of which they operate day to day, day in and day out, interaction by interaction, is yes, they are selfishly motivated, yes, they want to get theirs, and they don't really care how they must get it. They will basically do anything or say anything to get it particularly sociopaths. They are willing to go to extreme lengths in the moment to get what they need. Therefore, they can be cruel out of convenience. They are not typically like a psychopath going to be plotting and planning someone's murder or downfall as much as they will in the moment when they see an opportunity seize. They will lie, they will manipulate, they will even do physical harm. So what is the early origin story? You know, like we always want to know, were they born that way or did they just come out sort of like rotten to the core? And the real answer is no. Maybe it's convenient to think that people come out rotten to the core, but everybody comes out of the womb or of the C-section just as a little baby, you know, fresh to the world. World. They don't know what the world is yet. They're not destined to be evil. They're not destined to lie or manipulate or hurt people by no means. However, their early attachment styles, as you'll know from my channel, attachment is a key feature to how I frame and understand mental health. And that's because they're the first solid maps that we develop as babies in our neural networks of our brain where we orient to the world, where we begin to understand what is love, what is safety, what is danger, how do I get my needs met? That's where attachment comes from. And what's so important about attachment and attachment styles and attachment maps, as I call them, is they're developed by age two. That's right. By the age of two, a sociopath had basically developed a sociopathic foundation. Now, things in their life from age two until they were a young adult obviously could affect that and sort of push it in one direction or the other. But the framework, the, be the bedrock had been laid at a really, really early age. So in early childhood and teenager years, often sociopaths and psychopaths will be sort of called conduct disorder. And when we go to attachment styles, if we look at the dismissive attachment style, remember that's the type of attachment where the child is reaching out for help or support. Maybe it's crying or maybe it's just expressing joy. Either way, when the child sort of reaches out for reflection from the other back to the child that everything's okay or that they're being mirrored in a way so the child's excitement is mirrored by the parent's excitement or the child's sadness is mirrored by the parent's empathy. This child does not receive that mirroring often enough so that it develops what's called the dismissing attachment style. So this could be like a really cold parent, like a shutdown emotional parent. Maybe you have like a clinically depressed father who's an alcoholic, right? And he tends to just go into his own little world and drink himself into oblivion every single night. Well, the child has no idea what's going on. All the child reads is that I, when I call out to dad, dad ignores me uh, again and again and again right? Uh, a narcissistic parent, someone who's just completely self-involved, or indeed a sociopathic or psychopathic parent could also help set the foundation up for a psychopathic or a sociopathic child. On the other hand, a disorganized attachment style could also lead to a sociopathic individual later on in life. Remember, disorganized attachment is characterized by chaos in the home. There could be a lot of violence. Often it is an abusive dynamic, whether that's verbal, sexual, or physical. There is often sort of undiagnosed mental health disorders at the home or undiagnosed alcohol or, or, or drug dependency disorders within the home. And again, think about it from a child's perspective. Does a child know that dad and mom are, you know, undiagnosed schizophrenic or are absolute alcoholics and they get in a rage every time they get 
past a certain threshold of drinking? No, the child does not know that. How could they, right? So they just sort of characterize it as normal. That's the way things are. So therefore, to get my core needs met, I have to sort of like operate within this sort of wild and chaotic dynamic. And then later on in life, that sort of abuse that the child may have experienced or chaos could have led them to shut down and go inwardly into this sort of deep narcissism or deep sociopathy where they'll get their own needs met no matter what. And they don't really care about being cruel to other individuals. And this is really what sets the sociopath apart. They're willing to basically do whatever, including murder, and they will not be able to access uh, empathy for the victim of their crimes, of their lies, of their manipulation, and of their abuse. Treatment and recovery, is it possible for a sociopath? Well, typically we think of sociopaths as re first resisting treatment completely, and then when they get into treatment, maybe through court order or something like that, really just trying to game the system. That, again, is something that sets a sociopath apart from a narcissist. A narcissist tends to just shut down and, and not play the game or, or, you know, sort of play along but not let anything in in terms of therapy, whereas a sociopath is much more cunning. They're going to be trying to set false uh, pathways or false stories so that they actually are in control of the therapy. So in other words, they're trying to manipulate the therapist and not expose their true nature. They think they're able to outsmart the therapist. Now, empathogens, as I talked about in the last video, part one, dealing with narcissists, empathogens is a novel form of treatment that I think could hold some promise for individuals with sociopathy and individuals with psychopathy. And empathogens basically are, MDMA is the most common one, but you can see here there's a couple others, MDA, MDEA, and there's dozens of other empathogens. These are uh, novel chemicals that when taken allow individuals to access a deep felt experience sense of empathy, not normally accessible through talk therapy or through meditations or guided visualizations. How does it do it? Well, it seems to flood the body with dopamine and oxytocin. It allows a section of the brain to come on that is able to access empathy, maybe for the first time since early childhood. So remember, one of the things about sociopaths is that they have an inability to have empathy for their victims, right? When we engage with empathogens, what that does is it allows the sociopath to actually feel, maybe for the first time, the sadness or the pain that they have caused others without totally shutting down, without feeling the need to like escape at all costs. And that's the beauty and that's the novel promise of empathogens. Now, are sociopaths gonna go for treatment? Not typically, but if they find themselves in jail, perhaps we could experiment ethically, and I wanna be very cautious here, uh, with working with empathogens. So that's a certain approach that might be a novel treatment for a sociopathy. How do they treat others? Well, their self-hatred and self-disgust leads to using people for their own gain, and they may spontaneously lie, manipulate, misrepresent their intentions, cause division in others, uh, kill, harm, verbally abuse, sexually abuse, etc., to gain personally. So notice that this all predicates on deep self-hatred and deep self-disgust. Is the sociopath aware of their own self-hatred and self-disgust? Most typically not. Their walls are so complete that they've quarantined off that part of them that, that they really hate about themselves. That deep void inside, that core wound inside is really effectively shuttered off in the psyche of the sociopath. How do sociopaths treat others? Physical abuse sets sociopaths apart from narcissists. That is not to say that narcissists cannot be physically abusive because they can. Sociopaths tend toward physical abuse much more commonly. They, they find almost nothing wrong with it. Whereas narcissists might do physical abuse just more spontaneously within the context of a large fight or something like that. This is not to excuse any form of physical abuse. It's to distinguish the difference between them. Sociopaths have no remorse for others or the damage that they cause. They are really literally not able to access that. And we'll talk about that in a second. They tend to avoid prison and instead go towards corporate and political power where they are, quote, welcomed, where this cutthroat mentality of you must climb that ladder or you must get your way over and versus somebody else's way is sort of welcomed and rewarded. When people do that within corporate and political power structures, they're actually seen as the management material, right? And they get promoted through those systems. And it says here, one in five business leaders have sociopathic or psychopathic tendencies. That's nearly 20% of business leaders, and I would say political leaders, um, would have some of those tendencies. How do they experience themselves? Let's read through this here. Pain and fear centers in the brain, aka the amygdala, is smaller. 
Um, often we see non-reactivity in the amygdala when you put them in an fMRI. Empathy centers are also smaller and sort of downplayed or disconnected. And that particular region of the brain is called the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. And what's interesting about sociopaths is they do not respond to punitive measures or punishments. So you could throw them in jail or you could give them fines or you could put them in detention at school. They find no remorse in that circumstance. If anything, they find punishment more of a challenge, more of an obstacle to overcome, more of a way to figure out how never to get in that position again, or to come up with some lie or fabrication that can get them out of that position. But certainly when they're in detention or prison or in trouble with the law, they're not sitting there thinking remorsefully. They're not going to the introspective, like, what have I done? It's more about how can I get out of it and what have they done to me? Now that whole like shutting down of the amygdala and the event Central medial prefrontal cortex is associated with what's called dissociation predominant trauma. This is a form of PTSD and CPTSD as defined by Ruth Lanois and her research. She has found that in PTSD cases, 30% of individuals with PTSD have this dissociative sort of predominant trauma, as opposed to hyper aroused trauma, which uh, involves a sort of a hyperactivity of the amygdala. This version involves sort of a shutdown and a suppression of fear and also a suppression of sense of self and sense of pain. How do sociopaths experience themselves at the deepest core? Well, at the deepest sort of sense of self, there is self-hatred, shame, and a void, an emptiness inside. How they actually think about themselves in their own internal world is something along the lines of, I am the greatest, cleverest, funniest, smartest, I will get away with X, Y, Z, I'm better than so and so. Now, notice that the contradiction here is what they're thinking in their brain, what they're projecting to the world is this uber confident, sort of like sly, clever individual that can sort of win the game of life or win the game of power because they can play by any rules they want. They don't have to play by the rules. They have to find where the rules are weak and violate those areas. But on the inside, it's this deep void, lack, and sort of self-hatred that goes all the way back to attachment and early childhood development. And it makes a heck of a lot of sense if you can trace the history of these individuals. Now, the treatment, again, is not to sort of castigate them to prisons or to the fringes of society where they can really thrive and indeed multiply, uh, but rather to enfold them back into society through novel use of empathogens or things of that nature. And the small print here, addictions and coping strategies. What would a sociopath be addicted to most likely? Alcohol, workaholism, lying, uh, physical abuse, stimulants like uh, cocaine, external treatments, controlling strategies like verbal, emotional, and physical abuse, money, uh, causing or witnessing pain in others and power over other people. So causing or witnessing pain in others is what sets the sociopath apart from the narcissist. They don't tend to get off on that sort of experience where the sociopath may. And that leads directly, that's sort of the blurry line that connects the sociopath to the psychopath. The psychopath definitely gets off on the harm or the mistreatment of others. That's what they sort of live for to build that empty void inside or to fill that empty void inside. And that is the subject of part three, where we talk about psychopathy. So stick around and watch that video when it comes out. Now, wherever you're at in your mental health journey, if you want a little bit of mentorship, if you want a little bit of mental health community, please consider joining the Home Mentorship Program. What is it? Well, click the link below to find out, but basically you can pause the screen. That's kind of what it is there, but it's a service that I provide, a mentorship that I provide with you also being part of the mentorship. There's another link below if you'd like some free eBooks. I wrote these just to basically reward people for making it all the way to the end of my videos as a way for me to say thank you for making it this far. Go ahead and get your free eBooks and enjoy them. And that was Narcissist, Sociopath, or Psychopath. What's the origin story? Where do they come from? And how can you tell the difference? Part two, I will see you in part three, where we talk about psychopathy, the land of the serial killer. So it's, it's interesting. I think many people are sort of fascinated by serial killers, as am I. So part three will be all about the psychopath and what sets them apart. Uh, hint, attachment traumas are going to be involved. Surprise. On that note, thank you guys so much for watching the video all the way to the end. I really appreciate it. I hope you have a great day out there and I'll see you in the next video.